Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us for the third installment of our three-part briefing mini-series about the transportation sector and climate change. Today, we're going full steam ahead and discussing the state of play for public transit. I'm Dan Brissett, the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. EESI was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change policies to policymakers. We've also developed a program to provide on-bill technical assistance to rural utilities interested in on-bill financing programs for their customers. In our quest to educate policymakers and the public, we hold a lot of briefings and we write a lot of articles and fact sheets. And while we're very pleased to have you join us today, we also want to serve as a resource for you uh, later on, uh, perhaps when you're working on a transit bill or when you're replying to a constituent letter or for the public when you're writing a letter to your representatives in Congress about climate change. Everything we produce is available online at www.eesi.org. And to help make sure you never miss a thing, when you visit our website, take a moment and sign up for our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. We're gonna mix things up a little today. We will still hear from three panelists and I will be joined by my colleague, Anna McGinn, a little later for questions and answers. But most of our time today will be discussion. As we learn about this topic, public transit, and how transit systems across the country are responding to the challenges, financial, pandemic-related, and others facing their sector of the transportation, of transportation. We just thought if we would do this in person, it would work great as a roundtable discussion. And so we thought, why not try that? Before I announce our panelists, let me remind you that on Tuesday, we learned about efforts to improve the resilience of port facilities. And yesterday, we learned about sustainable aviation fuels and new approaches to lower emissions from commercial jets. You can access an archived webcast as well as written materials and slides from our panelists from Tuesday and yesterday. And the same goes for today. After we're finished, everything will be posted online at www.esi.org. And when we get to the discussion, we'd be very glad to incorporate your questions too. If you have a question, you have two options to ask it. You can send us a message on Twitter. You can follow us uh, at EESI online, or you can send us an email to EESI at EESI.org. We'll do our best to get to everyone's questions during our Q&A discussion. And now I get to introduce our panelists. Chris Liebon, a professional engineer, is LA Metro's Executive Officer, Environmental Compliance and Sustainability. Chris oversees LA Metro's internationally recognized environmental, environmental sustainability and energy initiatives. He's a published author and national speaker. He's also very involved in transportation and environmental industry and research activities, particularly as chair of several American Public Transportation Association subcommittees. Chris, uh, thanks for joining us from the West Coast this morning for you, for afternoon for us. Uh, <laughs> really happy to have you with us. Looking forward to your presentation. Yeah, thank you so much, Dan. Uh, and thank you so much to uh, your organization for uh, uh, having us here today. So I want to share my screen uh, now uh, uh, with the presentation. And, and while I'm doing that, uh, what I wanted to focus on in here uh, are pretty much not necessarily the uh, successes of our, our program uh, here in LA Metro, uh, but the challenges along with the successes uh, that we see and have seen over the past few years, uh, as well as you know, how this has changed through uh, the COVID crisis. So I'll go this through this really quickly, and I hope that you know the, the questions later on uh, will uh, uh, explore a little bit deeper on, on what uh, uh, some of the details are regarding this uh, presentation. So just for those who don't necessarily know who we are, we're the uh, LA County's uh, Regional Transit Planner, funder, uh, as well as the system builder and operator. Uh, in, in this particular sense, we're not really a county agency. We're a state chartered special jurisdiction uh, that builds and operates transportation system uh, here in LA County. In terms of our information on sustainability programs at the bottom of this slide, you know, you can go to that uh, website and uh, there's chock full uh, uh, sorts of information that you can enjoy uh, reading through uh, as you go through it. I won't go through this with the, uh, I won't go through this in detail, but just to give you a, a flavor of our sustainability program here, started out in 2007 and continuing on over the past uh, uh, 13 years. Uh, this program uh, has been cost neutral since 2017. It's not just projects, but the whole program itself. And how did we do that? We essentially have looked for alternative forms of funding and financing uh, and uh, allowing us to uh, work through uh, selling carbon credits, uh, looking for 
uh, private public partners, uh, as well as uh, additional uh, funding mechanisms that allow us not only to uh, pay for the program itself, but over the course of the last few years, had over $120 million in net revenue and reinvesting that in sustainability projects. Over the course of the next 10 years, uh, we will essentially be uh, working through uh, our uh, recently approved 10-year sustainability strategic plan, and uh, there's a financial analysis associated with that. We're projecting the revenues generated from the strategic plan to be a little bit over a quarter of a billion dollars. Uh, and, and continue on this with this self-sustaining, self-funding uh, program for the next decade. So what I want to uh, mention in this particular slide is everything has changed uh, post-COVID. You know, uh, the assumptions, the baseline conditions, uh, the, uh, uh, the conditions that we are operating in, in terms of how we not only operate as a system, not only how we um, uh, build our system, but how we actually work through the sustainability resiliency and, and other uh, frameworks uh, in, in our programs. Uh, and you know, it begs the questions, you know, what happens to the things we're already doing and are we using adequate, correct, adequate and correct tools. So within the agency and along the transit uh, uh, industry, you know, um, LA Metro has a recovery task force it's really looking at uh, some of these issues. Uh, in particular, this task force really looking at reimagining the system. Uh, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion principles are, are being uh, more highlighted. Uh, workforce development, and again, you know, alternative funding and financing, especially in this time of uh, reduced revenues and fair box recoveries. I, I won't go again uh, into detail here, but just want to highlight three things uh, that that's, uh, that's come out, coming out of, uh, uh, of this reimagining of our program. We're investing more in our people, uh, we're essentially looking at partnerships. Uh, these are key elements. Uh, we have sustainability council here in the agency that we'll work through. And then uh, finally, uh, we're looking at procurement innovations so that we, as a big agency, can not only influence you know, services and goods that flow into our agency, but allow other uh, parties who are participating in our recovery here in LA uh, to work with us uh, to ensure uh, the sustainability, resiliency, and all of the related items uh, could be uh, could be uh, realized. A couple more uh, slides, and then uh, should be done. Uh, uh, this one in particular, in, it's in terms of the infrastructure. You know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, LA Metro builds uh, in the transportation infrastructure system here. You know, not only are we considering the effects of infrastructure and environment, and that's through uh, the three bullets. Uh, uh, that consists of the, of the life cycle of, of a project, but also the effect of environment on infrastructure. You know, all hazards assessment, mitigation, adaptation, resiliency. As you can see on the right side there, those are the three plans that we have developed over the course of the last few years. You know, our resiliency framework on the top, then our climate action adaptation plan on the, on the left, uh, and then on the right side there, we're moving beyond sustainability. You know, uh, this is already a sustainable uh, transit. This is already a sustainable strategy to begin with. Uh, it's a net uh, using transit uh, and the effects of transit uh, results in the net displacement of greenhouse gas emissions. And the programs that we have here, as you, and as you will hear from my colleagues as well, is that anything that we do beyond the strategy of transit is moving beyond sustainability. A couple more things, and I uh, that to just provoke some ideas for those who are interested in, in reimagining infrastructure itself. Here in the agency, we're not waiting for for data science uh, to to essentially uh, evolve. We are incorporating the, the evolving data science, and how we do that is through this framework of adaptive design and flexible ad adaptation pathway. The short of this is that we're building on what we know right now, versus doing nothing about it. We're making our systems more resilient and sustainable. And then, because this has been adapted as a, a board policy, we're incorporating the new so climate science into future infrastructure to make those systems, and to make those infrastructures more adaptive to the uh, future effects of climate and infrastructure. Uh, and then at, uh, the, finally, on, on this particular sli slide, sustainability plan is always a requirement. You know, we're always asking our our constructors, our designers to uh, work through um, uh, new innovations, not only in materials, but also on, uh, on um, best practices in construction. 
I won't go into, uh, into detail here, but hopefully you would ask some questions in this. Here in California, there's uh, what we call is the Assembly Bill 2800 by Assembly Member Quirk for to essentially ensure uh, that climate science is incorporated into the design uh, and operations uh, and, uh, of, 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 of infrastructure. Uh, what you see here essentially are the results of a work that I have participated in as part of this, of this climate safe infrastructure working group. Uh, this bill has been reauthorized here in California. Uh, there's no more sunset in terms of uh, uh, the efforts of this group and as funding uh, becomes available, additional work coming out of uh, this group uh, uh, would be reconvened uh, and uh, be reported back to the legislature. And then finally, I just wanted to uh, give a kudos to the American Society of Civil Engineers uh, and, and the two big uh, uh, bullets here. Uh, the first one is the sustainability roadmap. You know, there's a standards coming out uh, through the ASCE efforts, uh, as well as uh, a manual of practice in incorporating climate data into science. Uh, there is a white paper right now on developing procurement documents, and there's a certification effort as well uh, for sustainable infrastructure engineers. I lead ASCE's uh, Committee on Sustainability, and all of these efforts are being done through that committee. And then last but not least, on, on the bottom of this slide, uh, we have formed an international coalition on sustainable infrastructure that actually focuses on the four bullet items in the bottom. Guidance, tools and standards, finance and funding, innovation as well as leadership and life cycle. And this infrastructure, this, this coalition now consists of uh, private organizations, an organization in the UK called Resilient Shift, the Global Covenant of Mayors, some of you may be members of that uh, in, in your own, uh, jurisdictions, and then uh, most recently, the Institution of Civil Engineers, uh, Civil Engineer, which is the equivalent of ASCE uh, in the UK. So with that, I conclude my remarks. This is my um, uh, contact information uh, and on the right side there on the right bottom, uh, more information on our programs. Thank you so much again, Dan, uh, and the rest of your staff for being here today uh, and for me to present this to, to this delegation and to, uh, to the audience. Thank you. Great, thanks, Chris. Uh, that was really interesting. Um, as a reminder, uh, if you want to go back and look at any of Chris's uh, slides, um, you know a lot of them had a lot of detail. So just as a reminder, everything that you see today, including the webcast, will be available online www.esi.org. So if you want to go back and look at those timeline slides in a little bit more detail, that's no problem. If you have any questions about what you just heard for Chris or what you're about to hear from our next two panelists, reminder you can follow us on Twitter at EESI online and ask us a question that way. You can also send us an email, eesi at eesi.org with your question. And now we get to turn to our second panelist. Cami Horn is the Senior Vice President of Development for Via Metropolitan Transit in San Antonio, Texas. Cami is responsible for service and capital planning, capital engineering, passenger amenities, and real estate acquisition and management. She was also recently appointed to represent Via on the City of San Antonio's Climate Ready Technical Advisory Committee. She's currently the Vice Chair of the American Public Transportation Association's Policy, Planning, and Program Development Committee. Welcome, Cami, to the briefing today, and um, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Dan, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're excited about this opportunity to speak with you today about via Metropolitan Transit in San Antonio, Texas, and our work in sustainability. So next slide, please. So this is just a slide showing many of our agency's statistics. Our service area covers more than 1,200 square miles, and we have a large fleet of over 500 buses, and I'll reference those later in the presentation today. So next slide, please. Um, so. Uh, just a little bit about VIA and our response to COVID. So VIA's response to COVID, as many other transit agencies across the country, was immediate and, and very comprehensive. And beginning with the service, we mapped the critical corridors to ensure that we were focused on the needs of our passengers and our essential workers. And an interesting uh, fact about our ridership, even in the initial stages of the shutdown, hovered around 50%. And that indicates really the need that, uh, that we have to serve our customers that did not have and do not have other options. 
So initially we eliminated fares and that reduced the need for operator and passenger contact. And we also added protective curtains in the buses as well. And we are now um, actually putting in uh, permanent uh, barrier doors in our buses as well. And our planning efforts focused on increasing frequency and service to critical corridors and destinations, all with an eye on equity to maintain and preserve our service. And as with others, our focus changed from increasing ridership to really understanding and then maintaining a physical distance with our policy of no more than 16 passengers per bus, and that's about half the seated capacity of a 40-foot bus. And we also focused on the communication of the service schedules to the public in the way that was as easy as possible to understand as we went through those service changes. And this also included the provisions for mask wearing on all of our VIA buses. Uh, next slide, please. So now a little bit, uh, I'm gonna touch on these topics here. As uh, Dr. Lieben mentioned, that public transportation is inherently green and any improvement to make it more attractive and efficient only furthers that goal. So I'll be touching on, on these in the next several slides. So first, compressed natural gas. So VIA's conversion to CNG began in 2017. And when fully implement, this will reduce NOx emissions by 97% from the diesel buses that they replaced. And VIA actually has the largest uh, CNG fuel facility of any transit agency in the US. And our fleet, as I mentioned, um, is about 78% CNG, so over 400 buses are fueled that way. And uh, these buses will actually also be able to use the renewable fleet that I'm going to talk about in the next slide. This is super exciting. Uh, new news about our partnership with CPS Energy. And CPS is the municipal electric utility servicing, serving the city of San Antonio. And so we have a partnership now with CPS, a new fuel supply partnership that will provide renewable natural gas created by landfill biogas uh, to VIA's fleet. And that is planned to begin uh, later in 2021. And when used as a vehicle fuel, RNG provides a substantial environmental benefit. It's an 85% reduction of CO2 emissions relative to diesel fuel. And the distribution and use of CNG gas uh, really emphasize both CPS energies and VIA's goal of reducing emissions and preserving the environment. So next slide, please. So uh, just a bit about solar and electric. So we have seven of our transit facilities that are fully or partially operated by solar. And nearly half of our shelters are actually currently lit with solar. And we continue to add solar to our facilities. And as we plan and even retrofit many of our facilities, we are including high efficiency LED lighting, native and drought uh, resistant landscaping, white roofs and other sustainable designs. And then regarding our fleet, uh, we now have three electric buses. And as we plan forward with our facilities, including new maintenance facilities, we are uh, planning for, for more electric into the future. Next slide, please. Um, as with others um, around the country, we participate in the EPA-led program that focuses on green power, and there's more information on the EPA website about this. Next slide, please. Uh, VIA also has a permanent pollution prevention plan, and we focus on many other areas of sustainability in our operations, including water, wastewater, and recycling. And I'm happy to answer any questions on this as we uh, go forward in the panel. And, and that's it for me. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Cami. Uh, really, really interesting. Um, looks like you have very nice bus stations and um, um, sort of bus stops in San Antonio. So they, they were great. Um, uh, if you missed anything, you want to go back, just as a reminder, everything will be available online. And it's still not too late to ask questions for the discussion, which will be coming up after our next panelist. 
Uh, and we're having shorter presentations today to really maximize that opportunity to discussion, uh, for discussion. Um, these systems have um, um, uh, just really interesting experiences that, that we want to get out there. Uh, our, and the way to ask questions is to follow us on Twitter at ESI online or send us an email, eesi at eesi.org. It is my pleasure to introduce our third panelist. Eric Johansson is the Chief Innovation Officer for the Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation Authority in Philadelphia. In this position, Eric is primarily responsible for business transformation programs through data analysis and corporate initiatives, including SEPTA's award-winning sustainability program. Mr. Johansson is the former co-chair of the American Public Transportation Association Sustainability Commitment Subcommittee and Sustainability Metrics Working Group. Welcome, Eric. It's great to see you. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for having me, and good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Um, so my presentation is really about how SEPTA approaches sustainability and has really always approached sustainability in a budget-neutral way. Uh, and I'm going to explain what that means, and I'm going to really emphasize that because I think that, you know, we get a lot of questions about how can you continue to do sustainability, how can you continue to do climate action in this era of extremely limited financial resources? And I think actually some of the lessons learned from SEPTA's experience, which historically has been a lot of extreme financial constraints, but still being able to implement a program like this, I think are instructive uh, moving forward into this era of COVID. Um, you know, as Chris mentioned, transit is inherently sustainable. Uh, this is a really important point because I think it gets lost in a lot of the technology conversations about how do we make transit greener. Transit has a value proposition that inherently is triple bottom line. We talk about driving the economy at SEPTA. We talk about supporting equity and quality of life. We talk about promoting safety and public health. We can back all of these things up with data and research that's you know, indisputable. Transit is an economic, social, and environmental net benefit to society. And so, and, 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 and inherent in that and shown on this wheel on this chart is that transit also advances sustainability. And on the right hand side of this chart, you can see that, you know, when we look at our four modes of travel and, and, and SEPTA has a multimodal system that serves the five counties of southeastern Pennsylvania, all of our modes, whether it be subway service, trolley service, our commuter rail, which we call our regional rail and our bus fleet, they're all lower emission intensity compared to a car. Uh, and so the more people you get riding transit, the fewer people that you have driving their cars or getting around with a, with, a, with a less efficient mode than transit is inherently a way to drive down emissions. So it's a really important point. Anytime I talk about sustainability at SEPTA, I always talk about transit as being inherently sustainable. And, you know, so what we, what we, the way we think of sustainability at SEPTA is really, you know, putting our money where our mouth is and going, taking it to the next level sort of as Chris said. And we, we've developed an award-winning program that's been recognized by the American Public Transportation Association, from the governor of Pennsylvania, from smart growth groups like 10,000 Friends of Pennsylvania, from industry groups like the Energy Storage Group of North America. A lot of, a lot of accolades for a program that really is, is founded on this triple bottom line approach, this comprehensive approach to sustainability which frankly, you know, we started this in 2011. We've been at it for almost 10 years now. I have never requested and we have never received a specific budget line item for sustainability. That's not to say that we haven't made investments in sustainability. We absolutely have. But for the most part, what we've tried to demonstrate is that sustainability isn't just good for the environment. It's good for our people and it's good for our bottom line. So we have an approach that we call budget neutral. And I say it means that there's no set budget for sustainability. And the way that we've implemented a lot of these programs that have resulted in this award-winning approach are things like financing agreements through power purchase agreements, energy performance contracts, P3s. 
We've gotten a lot of grants. We've been very successful with the FTA Lono program for you know uh, electric vehicles. We've gotten three grant awards for that. CMAC and the diesel, uh, the DIRA program, uh, our state energy development development authority or the PEDA. Um, and then we've also embedded sustainability into our core business. And I think you've heard, you heard a little bit about that from Chris and Cami. This has been one of the really fruitful um, ways that sustainability has been advanced at SEPTA by, by putting sustainability as a facet within capital projects and within operating programs um, through things like ISO 14001 certification for environmental and sustainability management. It's how our shops do business now. So we embed sustainability and environmental best practices into the way that we do business. So just some examples, um, because I think that that's a little bit theoretical and hard to wrap your head around. You know, I talk about, you know, the energy storage award. We have now nine batteries that look like this installed at our substations along our subway and our elevated lines written up in the New York Times. We've got 11 megawatts of storage along our system that capture energy created by braking trains called regenerative braking energy and use, reuses it in the system. Uh, didn't outlay a single dollar of internal support. We did a public-private partnership. We got a couple grants and we were able to completely finance that off budget. Um, I mentioned the three FTA Lono grants for battery electric buses, uh, both buses and infrastructure. Uh, and so if there's one area that I can foresee in the future that will be challenging, frankly, to maintain this battery electric, but uh, this, um, this budget neutral approach, it will be a conversion to electric bus technology. And we can talk a little bit about that in the Q&A. So far, we've been able to ramp up our program uh, with grants, but it, it, is a, it is a very expensive proposition and one that we're learning a lot about as we go. Um, I mentioned power purchase agreements. We've been able to implement some very large scale on-site rooftop solar as pictured here on the top. This is, of our, this is uh, the roof of our largest bus maintenance facility. You can see the Philadelphia skyline there in the background. Uh, and we've been able to do some utility scale offsite solar uh, where we've converted 20% of our uh, annual electricity load to solar by partnering through a virtual PPA with a firm out in central Pennsylvania that's building these, these solar fields on our behalf. And then I mentioned embedding into co core operations. SEPTA was um, fortunate enough to receive a a large FTA grant from the uh, fund that was set up for agencies impacted by Hurricane Sandy back in 2012 to, to seed fund what we call our, uh, uh, our climate resiliency program. And we have a series of power resiliency projects that have leveraged some of these technologies and are now actually providing a direct operational benefit. Uh, one of the ones that I'm proudest of is this solar and battery powered signal system where we have gone across our regional rail system and installed these solar panels. You can see this on top of signal huts along our regional rail system and installed battery packs that have enough power for 48 hours in the event of a, so a signal power failure. These signal power failures happen pretty frequently uh, when trees fall over onto our right of way, when other things uh, knock into them with extreme weather events happening more and more. Um, having a resilient signal power system is an incredibly important way to make our system um, more reliable and more robust in the face of extreme increasing trends in extreme weather. So we think that this is a really good example of how sustainable technologies are not only good for the environment, they're literally good for our business. Uh, and so this is another way that we've embedded sustainability uh, into our core business, supported by grant funding, but also uh, embedded into our core operations. So with that, I will, uh, I'll stop. Great. Uh, thanks, Eric. Uh, great presentation. Um, really interesting approach. And when, when, when you explain it, it sounds so logical. Um, it's uh, sustainability should just be built into everything. It's, um, it shouldn't take that much effort. <laughs> um, but it's great to have SEPTA's example with us today. Um, you may have noticed that while I was making my introductions, I mentioned the American Public Transportation Association three times, because all three of you are affiliated with it. 
uh, and shout out to um, APTA. They were one of our panelists at the Clean Energy Expo back at the end of July. So APTA and APTA affiliated panelists might be our most frequent contributors to ESI's briefings in 2020. So um, pretty cool. Um, and lots of, lots of great progress being made all over. Um, if you have any questions out in the audience, streaming us on YouTube or at eesi.org, you can follow us on Twitter at eesi online. Send us a question that way or send us an email to eesi at eesi.org. And now we're going to get into the Q&A, the discussion. Really looking forward to hearing this and, and participating in it, but only slightly, because now I get to introduce my colleague, Anna McGinn. Anna is a policy associate with ESI. She was on our policy team. Um, she, you, you probably recognize her name uh, on lots of articles, a uh, big part of our climate resilience report, a resilient future for coastal communities that came out a few weeks ago. Uh, and uh, she is going to lead us through uh, the Q&A. So Anna, I will turn it over to you. Great, thanks, Dan, and thank you to Chris and Cami and Eric for your presentations. And really excited to dive in here. So, um, as we start the discussion, I just want to reiterate a point that all three of you made, uh, but I think it's really key, and that's that public transit is already a key climate solution. And so, kind of starting our conversation from that point, I want to kick off the discussion with something that Eric started to get into, which is probably also a burning question on a lot of our viewers' minds which is how are transit agencies going to be able to continue climate and sustainability work given the economic impacts of COVID? And so Eric, you already started getting into this, but I'm hoping that um, maybe Cami, we can start with you and then we can go to Chris and look at um, kind of if you can get us a sense of how the work goes on and provide us some background on how the ways that climate and sustainability projects are funded um, allows that work to go on. So yeah, Cami, let's start with you. Okay, sure. And I appreciate uh, one of Chris's themes on people and partnerships, uh, because I think that that's, that's what a lot of this is about. And then there was also mention of a lot of um, grant opportunities, talking about things that we often tap into, such as the Congestion Mitigation Air Quality Program, CMAC. Um, so those are ongoing opportunities to tap into funding for, uh, for our work and our, our efforts. And then, I mean, just, I guess in the, in the future, I mean, I, I mentioned uh, our renew, renewable gas uh, partnership. Some of these things are going to inherently actually be cost savings. Um, and as we move into the future with these sustainable options, I mean, that's, that's one of the things that, that I see as a real opportunity as we move into the future and, and continue to, um, to make these upgrades and focus on sustainability in our facilities is the the inherent cost savings the partnerships with um with the cities our, our city of san antonio um we're working on um the um climate uh, change uh work with the city of san antonio and so all of those partnerships uh working together and um finding other opportunities for for grants as well so yeah So Anna, you want me to add on to that? That'd be great, Chris. Yeah, so yeah, just wanted to start. Uh, first of all, you know, just wanted to recognize, uh, Dan mentioned this already in you know, the American Public Transportation Association. Uh, there is a sustainability commitment uh, committee in there uh, that uh, pretty much puts together all the best practices uh, that are, um, uh, that other transit agencies are, are, are doing across the country. You know, uh, Petra Millet and Rich Weaver and, and their staff have done a great job in, in getting, you know, SEPTA, LA Metro, you know, and other public transit, and VIA and, and public, other public transit agencies to, to actually come together, you know, into a forum and share experiences uh, to make sustainability not only, you know, inherent in, in the public transportation arena, but, you know, as a way of life, you know, in those agencies. In our particular case, you know, uh, we approach sustainability uh, and resiliency here in the agency as a business. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, this program has been in place uh, for the last, uh, what, uh, 13 or so years. You know, our very first policies came out in 2007. You know, no, uh, it's unfunded mandate, a bunch of volunteers, 32 initiatives, uh, and really like staff scratching their heads on how to implement these things. 
But, you know, over the course of the last few years, you know, 2014 specifically, we approached our board and what we said is that, you know, we'd like to have the authority to explore alternative forms of funding and financing, you know, into our program. They gave us that authority and, you know, in working with our government relations, for example, uh, in working with uh, other groups within the agency, in, in listening to, you know, the community and other stakeholders, we're able to develop a program that, you know, shifted our uh, sustainability initiatives and programs from a cost center to a profit center. You know, so that's really key to, to where we are right now. And as I mentioned uh, in, in one of my slides, you know, um, um, we, since 2017, you know, um, we have uh, uh, been contributing to uh, what we call as the Green Fund here in the agency. And since 2017, this program has been cost neutral, the whole program itself. And then over the course of, of the last uh, three, you know, four years as well, you know, through um, uh, carbon credit sales, through uh, cost savings, through, uh, uh, you know, uh, other uh, similar forms of, of, of initiatives, we're able to generate, you know, over $100 million uh, that we put into the Green Fund. We extract, you know, uh, a few dollars of those uh, funds every single year, put that into sustainable sustainability projects and infrastructure and allow those projects to actually create monetizable values. You know, uh, uh, Tammy's RNG program, for example, is, uh, has been here in, in the agency for a few years now. Uh, um, every year we generate approximately uh, 100,000 carbon credits. You know, uh, we're just probably lucky here in California uh, that as a policy, cleaner fuel creates carbon credits uh, that can be sold into the open market and for those who go and advance their programs into uh, such aggressive uh, 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 initiatives that they financially benefit from it. You know, each carbon credit right now in California, uh, uh, LCFS credit uh, is, is valued at about $200 uh, dollars per, per, per credit. So if you could imagine 50,000 credits, you know, that we sell pretty much every year, uh, two hundred dollars is ten million dollars, almost ten million dollars that goes back into into the agency. And so, you know, um, uh, just to conclude, uh, really the, the point of of what I'm trying to say there is that you know we draw from the experiences of other agencies across the country. We're a very early adapter in any of these. APTA has been a a great partner in this and and uh, working through with our agencies. Uh, here in, in the LA, in the LA area, and, and allowing us to, uh, for the, our board, allowing us to, to have this entrepreneurial spirit uh, really makes this uh, program not only robust, but continue on despite the financial challenges that we face. Um, thanks, that was really interesting. Um, I have a follow-up question um, that I'd like to pose, and this comes from someone in our audience They sent this in. Um, the question is, and this came up, I think, made me think of it because you've mentioned funding and you've mentioned revenues and you've mentioned sort of funding sources. Um, could you explain the relative importance for your systems um, with respect to local governments, state governments, federal governments, um, whether it's a source for grants, source for revenues, sort of how your different agencies are funded, where you get, to the extent that you are receiving outside funding, where that goes. And then also, relatively speaking, are the policies that you rely on to operate, are they typically state, are they typically local, are they typically federal? What is that sort of interplay? Maybe Eric, um, we'll start with SEPTA and go, <clears throat> go around the horn with you. Yeah, I mean, so that's that's obviously a very big question. Um, you know, our, we're primarily actually funded as a state entity. Uh, we get uh, a, the lion's share of our operating funding from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, we get about half of our capital funding from the federal government and the other half from the states with uh, a match from the local counties. Uh, and then our board is comprised of representatives from each of the local counties and from the state. Uh, so, I, I mean, I would answer that question by saying it's all of the above for SEPTA. I mean, we, we are very uh, aware of the priorities of our local jurisdictions, of our 
of the Commonwealth and of the federal government. And we pay very close attention to all three levels of government. So I can go next. You know, for us in particular, we're, we're really sales tax dependent here in, uh, in LA. You know, we have Prop A, Prop C, Measure R, Measure M. Those are the uh, uh, voter initiatives that um, uh, have been passed by, by the voters here in, in our region uh, to fund the transportation systems that you know, people uh, here and our stakeholders here in the region uh, use and see and, and, and for us to build. Uh, one, one good, one great thing about Measure M, uh, the, the latest one that got passed in 2016, is that it has no sunset. You know, uh, for the next uh, 40 years, uh, uh, we're, we're, we have the opportunity to expand the transit system uh, and, and allow us to invest up to $120 billion for the next 40 years. And when the, once it's over, we start all over again, you know, so, um, so that's, that's a good thing for, for the stakeholders that we serve, uh, specifically the transit dependent population uh, that we, we, uh, uh, we serve. Um, in, in terms of the other, uh, of the other uh, um, levels of government, you know, we, we, we lobby obviously, you know, uh, on, on the federal level uh, for, for an infrastructure uh, funding that we build here. Uh, and then, you know, most recently we were part of uh, an APTA uh, consortium to, to actually look for and, and ask you know, for additional relief for transit uh, uh, across the country, including our system. You know, we received a little bit of that um, in the last stimulus package uh, from early part of this year. But it's not enough, you know, it's not enough. Uh, you know, we, we're moving, you know, uh, at our peak, we're moving one, almost 1 1.2, 1 1.3 million people. Uh, you know, we were down about 300,000 uh, people every day, you know, uh, but now we've recovered a little bit of that, 500,000 uh, passengers every day. And these are mostly transit dependent populations, you know, in, in the most, uh, you know, um, uh, vulnerable of our communities here in Los Angeles. And, you know, that's really our, our ask, you know, uh, the transit, as, as all of us have said already, is already a sustainable and resilient strategy. Why not invest more into it? and allow economic development, allow, you know, uh, cities like Philadelphia and San Antonio and, and Los Angeles to really benefit from all of that, you know. And then and finally, in terms of the state, you know, uh, we, we look at, you know, all of the initiatives here in the state of California that still focusing on sustainability and resiliency. Uh, like what I said earlier, we're an early adapter uh, on, of, of what uh, is coming out of, uh, of Sacramento. Uh, we look at that at, at, at most of the policies uh, that uh, and regulations that come out, and we use we try to use that to our advantage, uh, and and allow, and working with our government relations, allow those uh, those opportunities and relationships uh, to to actually uh, seek you know uh, any potential um, monetizable uh, benefit you know uh, with transit as a backbone you know for that strategy. And I can jump in here. Um, well, the city of San Antonio, I think, has historically had to be very creative because uh, we are primarily funded through um, through uh, sales tax, and um, only a half a cent, primarily half a cent. I won't go into detail there, but um, as opposed to a penny uh, for the other major uh, cities in Texas. So. We've had to be very creative and we will continue to be. But, you know, at the city level, we have incredible partnerships with the city of San Antonio. Um, also, they have partners with us to help fund our higher frequency routes. Um, we have a great partnership with them um, on the Bloomberg Climate Challenge. Um, also, I wanted to bring that up because that brought in resources for us to work with them on some really creative ideas uh, for sustainable uh, solutions moving forward. And, um, you know, of course, at a state level, we ha also have a tremendous partnership with the Texas Department of Transportation, not only through some funding for um, our capital projects, but um, we just opened, uh, they just opened, we just opened um, our first several miles of HOVs. And so we are partnering with TxDOT um, as op operator and maintainer of the HOV lanes. And that is just, uh, you know, that's a great way to share and move forward our, um, all of our combined objectives. And then I would just say on the federal side, um, we are working towards um, 
even more uh, federal funding. So we've had um, opportunities with with grants, as others have mentioned, and we uh, were successful in our, our Prop A in November, which gives us a, a little bit more a sustained uh, funding um, starting in 2026. So we'll be able to look forward to um, more assured um, local match there. And uh, I feel like this is the game of telephone. I'm not sure if I answered the specific question right, but maybe that's some interesting facts uh, that support it. So. Great, thanks so much. Okay, so I'm really excited to dive into this next topic because I know that all of you feel pretty passionately about it. Um, so electric buses. There are clearly plenty of challenges and opportunities to move bus fleets to electric. And so I'm hoping that we can spend the next couple of minutes digging into where your different agencies are at in terms of thinking about electric buses, what are the challenges, what are the opportunities, and kind of what needs to move uh, for your agency to uh, have even greater uptake um, with electric buses. And Eric, I know that SEPTA is one of the uh, agencies with the most electric buses, so let's start with you, and then we can go to Cami and then over to Chris. Yeah, I mean, we were a, a very early adopter of electric buses uh, at, at, a, at a very, at, at the time, and still actually to this day, a, a relatively large scale. Uh, instead of doing a pilot fleet of two or five or even 10, we did 25. We wanted to learn what the experience would be like to try to convert an entire route, and in fact, in our case, two entire routes to electric. Uh, and we've gone through those growing pains. It is definitely a sea change in the way operations occurs in the transit environment. And it has impacts from scheduling to maintenance to operations to, you know, the way that you run your districts. I mean, there is all kinds of stuff that we have learned from running those 25 buses. And what we're doing right now is we're putting all those lessons learned along with conversations ongoing with uh, other people in the industry to understand where this is all headed. You know, I mentioned in my presentation that we have a budget neutral approach to sustainability at SEPTA. One of the problems with electric buses that we're seeing is that it is very it is relatively easy to pilot electric buses. It is extremely difficult and expensive to bring electric buses to scale. Uh, and so what our master plan is really focused on is what are all of the dependencies and what are all of the factors that need to be considered to truly bring an electric bus service to scale across a 1500 bus, 2200 square mile service territory. Um, talking with our utility, you know, looking at various uh, charging solutions and trying to put all of that into cohesive documents so that when we go beyond the first 25 bus fleet, that we're doing so in a manner that is, that is building towards an actually scalable solution. And I, I really couldn't discuss those challenges better than, than you, Eric. I mean, you, you really laid it out. And with San Antonio's um, you know, funding, when you talk about that expense, we, we just want to, to be very cognizant in our planning forward that what we're planning for um, uh, is a fleet and, and solutions that are sustainable from an infrastructure standpoint. Um, that's, you know, that's incredibly important. And um, the one thing that I will say, though, is, is, is when we look at the objectives of emissions, and I think that uh, what we're doing, not only with CNG, but then additionally with the, our new partnership with C CPS, with the renewable gas, I mean, if we look at the objectives, I, I really think that we are headed down the, the, that path just incredibly well. Um, so I, I, Eric, thank you for that overview. Uh, when you, you know, right now, there's just a lot of changes in the technology, including just the very basic, uh, what the range is on the buses that, uh, that, that, uh, that they can go. So um, I'll turn it over to Chris. Yeah, th th thank you, Anna, for, for that question. And, you know, can't agree more with, with my colleagues on, on this. Uh, we're approaching this a little bit differently, uh, uh, though. Um, 
on, on, on several fronts. You know, um, we operate the largest uh, clean transportation system in the whole country, if not one of the largest. You know, 20, 23, 2400 uh, CNG buses already running on 100%, all of them are running on RNG. You know, so the question gets asked, you know, what is the, the ultimate goal, right? Um, is it zero emissions uh, locally or is it zero emissions over the life of, of, uh, of the transportation system? Because as you could sense, you know, um, while you're running these electric buses, if the, uh, if the source of the energy is not clean, it's not renewable, you're literally just transferring the emissions to somewhere else, right? So, so that's one part. The other part is that, you know, we have a commitment to transform all of that fleet, uh, uh, 2,300 or so uh, fleet, uh, to 100% zero emissions buses uh, by 2030, 10 years ahead of uh, uh, the, the mandate uh, that uh, here, in the, in, here in California for transit agencies. And, you know, for the most part, you know, I, this is my opinion, um, you know, for the most part, I am looking at this. Uh, as a uh, infrastructure project with a bus buy in the end. You know, our, our particular, uh, you know, um, uh, maintenance facilities, our, our properties uh, have been there uh, from when trains were running across LA and they were converted to bus depots. So communities grew around them. And if you go into our community, into those bus depots right now, you know, uh, it's barely inches between each bus and barely inches between the bus, right? Uh, on the front and the front and the side and, you know, put in electrical infrastructure in there and in the transition from CNG to ZEBs at some point, it becomes very challenging. And so, you know, for, for the most part, you know, that's just another perspective that, uh, that needs, to, that needs to, uh, to be looked at, right? And then the other part here too is the, Again, uh, on the transition side, you know, the workforce development, right? We are a very mature uh, in terms of, you know, age of our workforce organization. And, you know, a lot, a lot um, uh, has a lot of training, uh, a lot of uh, transition into newer technologies. Uh, how does that look like, you know, over the course of the next 10 years? We're preparing for it, don't get me wrong. Uh, we're, 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 we're ready for it. But, you know, uh, at the back of our minds, you know, how does that physically look like, right? Uh, you know, our, uh, and then finally, you know, um, uh, just the, 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 uh, the context of the OEMs, you know, there are a lot of bus manufacturers, ZEB manufacturers out there, you know, um, you know uh, if we can get some agreement between the manufacturers on, on some, what people claim as uh, trade secrets between, you know, uh, they're, they're different brands, you know, we would love to have, uh, you know, some policy, uh, even regulation to, to allow uh, these uh, technologies to have some uniformity across the system. And, and that's really part of the problem we have. We operate on 4,800 square miles of Los Angeles County. And I need sometimes to bring a bus, you know, on, on the other side of the county. And as you could sense, for example, electric buses, you know, if, if that bus is to travel 50, uh, 30, 50 miles one way, uh, just to support, you know, the, uh, the, the number of uh, patrons that we need to move in one county to the other, you know, um, I need to charge the electric bus, uh, even before it starts supporting, you know, or moving those people. So it's just some challenges, very high level, um, we're happy to engage with, with folks offline at some point uh, on some of our experiences here. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, I didn't think of that, but the buses are really close together. That's um, an interesting point. I hadn't, hadn't yeah. really thought of that one. But then again, I don't manage a bus fleet, so why would I? Yeah. Why would I think <laughs> of that? Um, that's why we have experts in. Um, we are, are just about out of time, but I want to sort of make one point, and I want to give um, just a quick second because uh, I, I think, Kimmy, I think I'm going to give you the last word today. Take more, uh, moderator's prerogative. Because I want to kind of circle back to the issue of equity and environmental and climate justice. Of course. Uh, at the end of all these briefings, I say something along the lines of, please take two minutes and fill out our survey. We'd love to hear what you think. We're always trying to do better. Well, one of the comments that we've been, that we recently got was trying to sort of at the end of these briefings frame sort of a takeaway. And this is something that came out much like all of your presentations included the general theme that public transit is inherently sustainable. 
something else I think that I took away from everything that you had to say today, the three of you, was that people depend on these systems. They depend on these technologies. They should be clean. These things are rolling through their communities. There seems to me to be a very clear nexus of climate equity, climate justice, um, and, and sustainability. Tammy, um, I think uh, you have something that you wanted to bring up uh, with respect to an equity related initiative with VIA. And so I'm happy to give you the last couple seconds uh, to, to give a quick overview. And then I'll, uh, well, I'm afraid that we'll have to end there and because um, uh, we are bumping up against the one o'clock uh, time frame. but I'll turn it over to you. I'll just say that, that VIA is constantly looking at the equity, equitability of its service. And, um, you know, so every time we make a change, uh, we've just been, um, even during the emergency changes, we made sure that the service that we provided was equitable across our region. Um, and I think all the points that you just made, Dan, I can't say it any better that the public transportation uh, provides so many benefits and it actually provides everyone a choice. So. I'll leave it at that. And thank you very much for this great opportunity to uh, participate in this panel. Great, thanks, Cami. And Eric and Chris, my guess is that you would endorse uh, what Cami had to say, um, um, but uh, unfortunately we're out of time and we have to wrap up. But you guys did such a great job. This is such an interesting panel, um, such a great discussion. It was a bit of an experiment on our part, but. The discussion was fabulous and I took a lot away from it. And um, thanks to Anna for her uh, expert moderation. Um, and uh, I guess you would say keeping the trains running on time. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we're, we're gonna conclude. This is the end of our three part series, if you or mini series, if you missed any of it, of course, it's available uh, on our website, www.eesi.org. If you have a moment to take our survey, um, we really do listen to your feedback and we even try to incorporate it into our briefings, just like I always say. So if you have a few moments today to, to tell us what you thought of today, the discussion format, the balance between presentations, discussions, if anything else, topics that you want to see, please let us know. We do take them very seriously. And with that, we will start closing out. But I have to say thanks again to our three wonderful panelists and also to everyone else at ESI who makes this possible. Anna. Thank you for co-moderating with me today. Thanks to Omri, Dan O'Brien, Sydney O'Shaughnessy, uh, Amber Todorov, our colleague on the policy team, uh, as well as our wonderful interns, Emma, Joseph, Hamilton, and Karen, who are helping us with Twitter and social media and getting us these great questions from our audience. So we will go ahead and end there. Thanks again for everyone's participation. Thanks to our panelists and hope everyone has a great rest of your Thursday. <laughs>